And now we get to kind of switch some roles. You're going from host to the guest. So yeah. <laughs> what, what are we in store for? And do you need to queue up anything at all so we can get you ready to go? Uh, also, all right. our, our plant game is pretty strong here between my Monstera and your big Alocasias. Leaves well, this this stuff. one's like a green screen, so I think I yours know. wins. <laughs> yeah, these, are, these, are, these are some real biodiversity in my apartment here in DC. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's game up biodiversity over there. <laughs> right, let me just whip up my share screen. Wonderful. Okay. How are things over in Washington with you? Things are great. I mean, we are, we're in the middle of spring, ramping up towards summer, so can't complain there. I got to talk earlier with um, Anand Varma and a few other great uh, scientists, and I'm here uh, getting to spend my Friday night with you and a few other amazing explorers and, ex and experts. Really, I can't complain about much right now. <laughs> all right, I'm all good to go. Great, well then I will let you take over and I'm gonna add your slideshow to the stream and I'll bow out and let you go. Fantastic, thank you kind sir. Hi everyone and welcome to my session on Project Moniet. I'm just gonna make it into a full screen in case people have difficulty looking at it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wes. Um, so basically Moniet in Bahasa Malaysia means monkey although it's also used casually to include apes. And it's essentially a photography project with Roots and Shoots Malaysia to photograph Malaysia's primates. Uh, now, um, so how did this all begin? Well, it really began when Dr. Jane Goodall uh, made her second visit uh, to Malaysia in 2017. And during that trip, she basically asked me about Malaysia's primates. So the question was, how are Malaysia's primates doing? And of course, at that time, I had no clue. However, Malaysia being one of the more technologically savvy countries uh, around, you know, we're all glued to our uh, gadgets and we all can't live without social media. Um, I told her very confidently, all answers are on Google. So I began Googling away. However, nothing came up. Zilch, zero. This really, really perplexed me. <laughs> so I began to, to ask, questions like, why are there no answers? Guys, it's 2017 and, and I, I don't even know how many species of primates there are in Malaysia. So after talking to uh, many uh, researchers with the, uh, who are with, for example, the Malaysian Primatological Society, which was also just established then, um, I asked around and I said, okay, so, so obviously there are more questions than answers. What can I do to help? Because um, at that time, well, still uh, before COVID, I I was essentially a musical theater performer. So um, I loved photography all my life. I've always had a camera and I've always loved taking photos, but it was never the full-time job, right? The full-time job was getting your my, my butt on stage all dolled up and, you know, hit a few high notes. So I asked the researchers, what, what help do you need? And they basically said, well, it would be nice to get more photographs of these species because um, some of the photographs are are old, so they're not so high res, so they're not uh, they they can't be used easily for um, research and outreach programs. So I thought, okay, I can do that. I've got a camera, I can click a snap or two. How difficult can it be? <laughs> well, famous last words, right? Never, never, never say that. <laughs> so this trip to photograph all of Malaysia's primates has led me so far to every single state in Malaysia from the northernmost tip of the peninsula to the deepest, darkest jungles of North Borneo. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Malaysia, we have jungles that are older than the Amazon. They're at least 130 million years old. Um, we are one of the 17 most biodiverse nations in the world, which is incredible given our relatively small size. Um, new discoveries are being made Constantly, and I mean constantly. I, I, last month, I believe a new frog was discovered in northern Borneo in Sarawak. Um, however, despite all this wonderful biodiversity, our unique and amazing uh, uh, wildlife are also disappearing and disappearing fast, like the Malayan tiger, which is you know uh, down to the last hundred. Um, so a lot of work still needs to be done. But uh, going forward on this little sojourn throughout Malaysia, I discovered that Malaysia has a total of 25 different primate species so far. So far. <laughs> There's still a lot we do not know about them, um, but from uh, the little that we do know, 
we know that two are currently critically endangered. 11 species are considered and counted to be endangered, and three are data deficient. What does that mean, data deficient? That was the same question I asked when I, when I came across that term. I was like, what do you mean by data deficient? How can something be data deficient in 2019? And they were like, well, it just basically means no studies ever done before, period, full stop. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay, this is terrible. You know, for, for a, a nation that's not very large, we still do not know what's in our backyard, in our jungle. So off I went with my little camera snapping away. So I'm just going to show you a couple of images from now on um, of what I discovered on my journey. So this here is an image of Kuala Lumpur, our capital city, where I'm currently uh, coming to you from. It is a, a relatively large city. It's a sprawling city, and we have uh, lots of skyscrapers. As you can see, there's one little one here being built, and it'll be one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world when it is complete. Uh, why we need more skyscrapers, I do not know. But anyway, there it is. Um, and as you can see as well, we are, uh, for capital city, we still have a lot of lush green in, in the foreground, and we are ringed by mountain ranges in the back. Um, some of the most beautiful uh, mountain cloud forests I've ever been in, actually. So even in, within Kuala Lumpur city, we have so much biodiversity packed into the city. We have eagles, owls, snakes, and of course, primates. Um, one of them is this very shy white thigh surili. Um, very little is known about them. Um, <laughs> these are, uh, they, they have been studies done on them before, but again, uh, not very uh, recent studies. Um, so very little is still known about this species and definitely very, very little is known about this population uh, within the heart of the capital city. There have been separate troops that I've discovered uh, within the, uh, 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 the capital city and its surrounding neighborhoods. And actually, even people who live in Kuala Lumpur city all their lives never even realize that these primates exist in their own city. So there are no studies currently done on this current population in the city. And we, we hope that you know uh, this will change. Uh, I was speaking to someone who is about to embark uh, to study um, these primates here in our city. Um, next, you can see this adorable little one is called uh, a long tilt macaque clinging onto its mum. Now, these uh, monkeys, uh, these monets, these macaques are the, the most adapted primate to urban life. Uh, you know, apart from mankind, I think these guys really, really love hanging out in urban centers, in urban areas. Unfortunately, long-tailed macaques have become viewed as a menace, um, and it's given rise to a lot of issues uh, with regards to human-wildlife conflict. Uh, yes, uh, overdevelopment, overexpansion of urban areas is, is partly to blame, but also um, this 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 uh, uh, misconception that people have that oh you know it's a monkey it's wild poor thing has lost its home and so let me feed it and so they feed it however um, that uh, raises a whole that opens a whole different can of worms because not only uh, do they become hooked on the sugars and salts in our food they then become emboldened and sometimes uh, they they do attack uh, people because they're so used to getting food from people. So it's something that we have to address. Now, Malaysia is not just a land of skyscrapers and uh, big urban areas. We are also blessed with many stunning islands uh, with local primate populations. One of them is this uh, really, really adorable species of primate called the dusky leaf monkey. Um, they're found uh, also on the mainland of the peninsula, but they're also uh, found on islands in Langkawi and Penang on the west coast. Um, and one of the most remarkable things about this species is that they have golden babies. Take a look. So that's mummy there, and that's a newborn, and it will slowly begin to change color. You can just see like its face at the tip of its nose. That's where the color uh, uh, starts to change. Um, it will spread throughout its body as it gets older and eventually it'll look more and more like mum. But in the meantime, while it's young, it is gold. And this has led to a huge spike in poaching. One of the main challenges I discovered uh, while embarking on this photography journey is that we have a huge problem with wildlife poaching here in Malaysia. Um, uh, there's such a huge demand for these golden babies. You can actually find them for sale on TikTok, on uh, Instagram, on Facebook. 
Um, and it's it's really quite dire. Um, people uh, buy them, dress them up, um, you know, and and so what I hope to do with uh, with my Project Monet campaigns as it gets disseminated through schools um, and over social media as well is to educate people that these primates do not belong in your homes. These primates belong in the wild um, because a, a, what a lot of people don't realize that is that these primates, especially these leaf monkeys, they cannot um, eat fruits that we normally associate with monkeys like ripe bananas or oranges or apples. They're leaf monkeys, so their main diet consists of leaf, bark um, and raw fruit. Their stomach has four chambers like a cow to help them process all this fiber. So what usually happens is that when they become someone else's pet, um, they get fed all the wrong foods and a lot of these babies do not live to see a couple of months. And that's tragic. Well, these are currently endangered, and all, uh, but there is a wonderful NGO called the Langer Project Penang, uh, which is currently making canopy bridges for them. Uh, from recycled firehouses so that they uh, are not susceptible to become becoming roadkill. So do check them out, Langer Project Penang. Uh, moving swiftly on, now we jump across the South China Sea because Malaysia is split into two. We've got Peninsula Malaysia in the west and we've got Borneo Malaysia in the east. Two, uh, two wonderful uh, territories in northern Borneo which, uh, which are part of Malaysia. Um, they are Sabah and Sarawak. And uh, this is where we can find um, one of the most beautiful uh, primates, I, I think, in the world. And it is, of course, the orangutan. One of the great apes, it still remains, till today, critically endangered. And there's really nothing like seeing a great ape in the wild. So once this whole coronavirus thing is blown over, um, do consider making your way over to Borneo um, to support the local uh, ecotourism uh, operators there to get them back on their feet and, and in that way contribute directly to the sustenance of the orangutan in the wild. Um, they face threats that are not just limited to palm oil, contrary to most popular opinion. They are still threatened with poaching. It's a huge problem. I cannot emphasize enough how huge poaching actually is. There was a case recently, I think in 2019, um, a Russian tourist was smuggling a drugged baby orangutan out of Indonesia. A drugged baby orangutan that he packed into his luggage out of Indonesia. So that should that, that should tell you the extent um, people will go to to poach a wild primate. <clears throat> so over here um, is a is an older photo. It was taken in 2015 in Sabah. This was uh, my first actually encounter of an orangutan in the wild. That was I was very very fortunate to have shared in. Um, so the mummy that you see there, her name is Hope. Um, she was uh, one of the uh, fortunate uh, orangutans to be rescued from the illegal uh, pet trade. And she was uh, handed over to the uh, rehabilitation center in Sabah. Um, and she was fortunate enough to have been deemed uh, fit enough and sound enough to be released into the wild. And this is her baby Doris. Um, which uh, at that time, she was one of two females to have successfully mated and reproduced in the wild. It takes a long time to rehabilitate an orangutan or any ape for that matter because a lot of their knowledge has to be learned from mum itself. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge success when we can finally actually release an orangutan back into the wild. So over here, you can see her with her little baby Doris. Um, sadly, baby Doris did not live till maturity because Hope herself was still, uh, uh, this was her first time being a mother. She um, obviously was not fully equipped to become a mother, um, still missing some skills uh, that were not handed down to her from her mom because she was an, an, an orphan. Um, so this is why um, we, we must do something to address this uh, illegal poaching, not just from the selling and the poachers, but also the buying, international buying. International buying must come to a complete halt. Um, so uh, what can you do? You can also just talk about it, talk about the threat of, of, of poaching, talk about um, the horrors of having private zoos. Um, this all has to stop. Um, but on the flip side, a good side, um, she um, became pregnant again with her second child, and she's currently still in the wild, I believe, raising it successfully this time. So I'm wishing her all the best, and I hope that once this lockdown situation is over, I will have the good fortune to encounter her once again in the jungles of Sabah. 
Moving back to the peninsula, to this little idyllic state, which is in the north of the peninsula. Um, this is the state of Perlis, um, and it's a beautiful state, um, beautiful paddy fields, part of the rice bowl of Malaysia. And it's joined, uh, we are, um, the peninsula of Malaysia is actually connected to the main body of Asia by this little strip of land called the Isthmus of Kra. Isn't that a really sexy name, the Isthmus of Kra? <laughs> I've, I've always thought it to be really, really fascinating and a fascinating place to go to. And uh, one of the main reasons why it's so fascinating to me is because it has a primate species there that is not found anywhere else in Malaysia. In fact, this primate species that's only found in Perlis is actually a northern primate species. It's found all the way up to the Himalayas. You're talking about really high altitudes and really, really cold. Very, very, very unlike the balmy tropical flat plains of Perlis. And this is the little guy that you will see if you ever get a chance to visit the forest of Perlis. It's a stump-tailed macaque, or otherwise known as a bear macaque, given its shaggy brown fur and trademark red face. As you can see from its fur alone, you know, it's, it's, it's really meant to be a northern uh, primate. Um, but we do not know how this population has wound up here in Perlis in the northernmost part of Malaysia, but there is a small pocket of them. Even people in Perlis are not aware of their existence. In fact, uh, people who are aware of the existence are actually only found in a couple of villages that are situated near the Thai border where this population roams. Um, and what is so mind-blowing is that studies on this Malaysian population of the stump-tailed macaque have only just recently begun in as early as you know, 2018, 2019. So, um, there's still so many questions that we have, um, and I've been so fortunate to uh, encounter these researchers working with uh, working with the stumptail macaque and Perlis. Um, they're doing an incredible job documenting them. Now they're on to counting the number of individuals in the troop um, and also determining their roaming patterns so that we can also preserve their habitat. So, um, so much is being discovered as we speak here in Malaysia. And from the flat plains of Perlis, we go up now to a very, very different um, habitat, uh, different part of Malaysia. Um, in the middle of peninsular Malaysia, we have these huge, amazing highlands. They're rainforests that are up in the clouds. They're really, literally cloud forests. Um, and when you wake up early in the morning, you are greeted with scenes like this an ocean of clouds just rising from the valleys. And the only thing that peaks out of these oceans are the very, very tips of these high jungle covered mountains. And these jungles are as old as 130 million years old. And um, so this whole system is also known as the central forest spine of the peninsula. It's not only important for our biodiversity, um, because that's where a lot of the, uh, the habitat can be found. But it also provides 80% of our country's drinking water. So this whole um, environment, this whole habitat of the central forest spine is so crucial to our country and also to the world because um, it provides so much oxygen as well. And in this uh, wonderful, hilly, pristine environment, you can find... Uh, one of mankind's lesser known cousins, the gibbons. <laughs> I love gibbons. They are the musicians of the forest as well as the cicadas. So that is, that is the sound that you will hear if you ever get the fortune, the good fortune of entering into a Malaysian rainforest, a pristine Malaysian rainforest. You will hear cicadas and you will hear gibbon song. That's right. They are the only primates that, that sing and their songs are... They, they ring all across the mountains, all through the jungles. Unfortunately, um, they're also threatened at the moment by poaching. Um, I recently got a, a direct message into my Instagram the other day from someone in Dubai with a pet gibbon uh, asking me how to care for his pet gibbon because it did not look too well. And I, the first question I asked was, how did how did it get to Dubai? Um, you know, these, these uh, 
gibbons are are mostly found in Southeast Asia. Some of the, you you do have a few species that go up north to China and also across to India, but that's it. They are mainly a Southeast Asian ape. Um, how did it get to Dubai? Obviously, from the illegal wildlife pet trade. So I, I tried to advise him to turn it over to his his zoo, um, but he went silent. But that that is the current threat, folks, that we're talking about with regards to wildlife poaching. The buying has to stop. Um, there is a society here, the Gibbon Protection Society, here in Malaysia that rehabilitates them, and, and they hope to release um, the rehabilitated gibbons back into the wild. But again, it's a really uphill battle because you're talking about imparting skills and knowledge of how to survive in the forest, um, which they normally learn from their parent. So with gibbons, um, they are monogamous. They live in family units, very unlike other primates except for mankind. So it's mummy, daddy, um, an older juvenile, and a young baby. So if you were to take the, the young baby to sell, you would have to... If, essentially wipe out the entire family as well, because no family will release their baby to be sold, right? Humans too. So that has led to the steep decline in their population as well. So really, it's not just about, you know, um, habitat loss. It really is this, this terrible thing called um, the illegal wildlife trade. It has to stop. And this other image here is the largest of the given species that can be found in the peninsula Malaysia and also in nearing Sumatra. This is the Siamang. It's the largest uh, non-human ape here in the peninsula and it's also endangered due to uh, the fragmentation of its natural habitat. And sadly, many Malaysians have probably never seen one before or even heard its beautiful song in the forest. It remains uh, one of the fastest brachiators in the world. If you ever have the good fortune of watching them swing from tree to tree, in the jungle, I guarantee you, you'll be left breathless. So if you ever have the time, once this whole COVID situation clears up, I would highly recommend a trip to the Malaysian brain, uh, rainforest to check out our gibbon cousins. And finally, down to this uh, little uh, <laughs> this little territory um, we're heading into on a boat here. Uh, you see fishing villages on the left and right, and we're going past uh, some mangrove swamps before we hit the ocean. Um, Malaysia is a truly blessed country. We are surrounded not just by jungles and mountains, but also surrounded by ocean. And with oceans come uh, the mangrove uh, systems, the mangrove forests, which play a huge role in not just protecting our um, coastal communities from storms and floods, um, but they also provide homes for other primates. And one of them is this... Selangor silver leaf monkey, which was only recently discovered to be its own distinct species in 2013. So that's how recent it has been that, oh wow, you know, we have a new species of monkey, 2013. So it's called the Selangor silver leaf monkey after the state that it was discovered to be a, a separate species, the state of Selangor. And it's restricted largely to the west coast of the peninsula. So if you ever come to this part of the world, just uh, head over here to Selangor. And these are one of the few primates that you'll be able to see, to see outside of Kuala Lumpur. Again, as you can see, it's a, a leaf monkey and uh, the baby here is born orange. And this here, the shaggy black fur behind it, uh, enveloping it, is the warm embrace of mummy. And so... As you can see, his face is starting to change color um, as well, and he will eventually become uh, a silvery black, uh, like his mummy behind him. So what um, what can you do, right? Uh, people always ask me, what can you do? You know, the uh, things always seem so bleak and so dark, but there are a couple of things throughout this uh, journey that I've taken uh, just in 2018, you know, until now, uh, that that you can make a difference. And uh, so these are the steps which I highly recommend. Lend your voice. Um, Malaysians uh, and a lot of other uh, people all around the world are, you know, we, we have social media, we have a voice. We have a voice online. Use it, use it, use it, use it. Um, you, we, for those of you who are able to vote, use your vote. Um, raise these issues such as uh, the illegal wildlife pet trade. Use your vote, use your voice. Engage in citizen science. Citizen science is everywhere. Check out the iNaturalist app. You can go around taking photos and uploading it. Um, that helps scientists also keep track of the wildlife and biodiversity in your neighborhood and your community. Encourage ecotourism. Um, it needs to be a win-win situation for 
humans as well as the wildlife. So I do encourage people to go and check out ecotourism projects and also support local communities and NGOs. These are the guys on the front lines of biodiversity protection uh, here in Malaysia, and they would uh, appreciate any help they can get. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this. Um, this is Dr. Jane Goodall at the launch of Project Moniet uh, exhibition in 2019 before the world turned on its head. So um, I leave you with her quote, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So think about it, folks, and I hope you make a decision to join us and uh, join this fight to protect our biodiversity. So uh, for those of you who would like to find out more, you can always check me out, uh, Project Moniet, on Facebook and Instagram, and all those photos are by me. My Instagram is Peter the Dragon, and I'm Peter Ong, signing off. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Peter. That was a really incredible trip through all of Malaysia and so many incredibly unique animals. It's really, <laughs> I mean, I, so there's 25 that you say are in Malaysia, right? Yes, we have 25 at the moment that we are aware of, you know. Um, of course, there's still things that we are not aware of, given how little we actually know. Mm. So that may change. Well, that was actually my question. I was wondering, um, with, with this rarity of the animals, how are you able to find them to photograph them? Like, how, do you have collaborators? Who do you work with? How do you safely photograph such rare animals? Oh, it's been an adventure of itself. Just trying to find... The location of these animals is like, wow, <laughs> that's like three quarters of the battle. So it, it, it involved me uh, reaching out to uh, researchers, although they may not be researching the same species or the same animal, they might have uh, knowledge or information about sightings of this other species. And they can point me to the area where then I will go and try to make friends with um, the local uh, villages around there and try to get more information out of them. Um, um, most of the time, I admit, it's still like trying to find a needle in a haystack, but we got to start somewhere, right? So we stop. Oh, of course, no. And I wonder too, uh, is there ever a concern? And this is a question I'm thinking of. I've got a few more from the viewers, but are you ever worried about revealing where they might be? Do you try and keep their location secret? Uh, how do you balance that need to protect them and, of course, showcase them so they will be known? Yes, so obviously, um, with regards to the, 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 more, um, the more poached animals, we will try to keep it secret. Um, however, unfortunately, it's not the case. So like with the dusky leaf monkeys and the slang or silver leaf monkeys, they're, they're, they're actually quite visible and they, they're very, very gentle, shy creatures. They're not even, uh, you know, they, they don't even bite to defend themselves. So people literally just go up to the mum and just yank the baby out of its arms. So, you know, so yes, we want to keep it secret, but at the same time, we need to highlight this, you know, that this has to stop, that communities who live in this area should not participate in such activities and that the purchasing, I mean, yes, there will always be unscrupulous people who will sell and try to make a buck, but the buying has to stop. It stops with us. That is incredibly true. And like it, the one small thing you can do is not support also like private zoos. I know you'd mentioned in other ways where there are animals as entertainment. Um, so those should all, you know, not be places that you as a viewer, as someone who cares about the planet and biodiversity should not participate in. Um, and speaking of the wider biodiversity and thinking about that, um, are there any initiatives to bring some of this education about biodiversity into schools or if not, where can people find out more information about the biodiversity locally around them within Malaysia? Yes, so uh, Roots and Shoots Malaysia is currently running a program called EcoVira. <laughs> so we go. are trying to uh, wor work with various local schools and we also work with other organizations in Malaysia like the Habitat Foundation. Um, Justine Vaz will be speaking tomorrow as well. Um, so we are, we are trying to bring biodiversity and uh, uh, environmental knowledge into schools uh, and also to equip them with uh, skills to make a sustainable living because again you know the communities have to win as well um, we need to show them that there is a way where uh, biodiversity and conservation wins and you can win as well no and that's one thing that's been a common theme i've noticed you know in watching the biodiversity festival is that we are part of the ecosystem so we have to think about it as connected to us. So it's not just the animals in isolation. 
it's how we interact with them as well. And it's a really great point to think about the communities around them. Um, I have to say it was really wonderful to just see the breadth of the wildlife that is, you know, in Malaysia. And I want to thank you for sharing that with us and your photography for tonight and the message of, you know, we can do something, whether it's citizen science or just being involved. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Wes. And hopefully we'll see you in Malaysia one of these days. Oh, I think there's a definite possibility. I'm, I want to make it that way and see all them for my, see all the primates for myself. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of the night. Thank you.